Welcome to the pre-course webinar, ECG 12 Lead Interpretation, a pre-course review presented by myself, Chris, Christine Hardy, Regional Paramedic Educator, and Dwayne Cattell, he's also a Regional Paramedic Educator. So the objectives for this pre-course uh, webinar are to recognize common ECG rhythms, recognize common 12 lead changes, and identify situations where the advanced application of ECG and 12 lead interpretation may be benef beneficial to your practice in pre-hospital care. So now we'll look at a case study here. So you've been sent code 4 uh, for a patient complaining of chest pain, has a history of uh, MI, hypertension, and uh, type 2 diabetes. When you get there, you find a 65-year-old male patient uh, is having uh, chest pain, describes it as crushing, um, and it's going down both arms. So it came on suddenly, and uh, he has vomited twice. So take a minute and think about how you would go about treating this patient. So we'll look at our, uh, our treatment modalities, right? You do your primary exam, um, you get some oxygen on the patient, you get the monitor on the patient, um, looking at uh, lead two, um, you know, do your vital signs, uh, consider nitroglycerin if there's no contraindications, if they meet all the parameters, uh, aspirin if there's no contraindications, if they meet all the parameters, administer your aspirin, the appropriate dosing. Um, do your 12 lead. Okay, uh, start transporting the patient and then continuing care en route. Vitals every five minutes, repeating nitroglycerin as long as there's uh, vital signs worth in parameters. You know, I think it's important to note that when we see consider in our medical directives, it means do if your patient fits the parameters for administration of a medication or um, any type of procedure. procedure. So you have your monitor on, um, you haven't done your 12 lead yet, but um, you look at lead two and you print out a quick, you know, 10 second strip, 20 second strip, and this is what you have. So this is the 12 lead printout from your patient. It does not indicate that there's a STEMI present. However, looking at leads two, three ABF, your inferior leads, you see some um, ischemia and it looks like some ST depression, possibly an AVL. Yeah, and there's T wave inversion in lead three and AVL, which is one of the very first signs uh, indicative of uh, ischemia. Mm -hmm. So something that we haven't mentioned is actually the order that these events should occur. Um, according to the Medical Advisory Council, there is no real order you have to follow when you're administering nitro ASA and performing a 12 lead. It's perform your 12 lead when it's feasible in your call. Um, you don't want to delay medication administration, but everything should happen kind of in, in all tangent the same time. and all at the same time. So there's no um, direct order it must occur in. Um, so moving on, what's the difference between the 12 lead ECG and your lead 2 ECG? Well, our lead 2 ECG is a non diagnostic. Um, ECG tracing, which means you can identify the heart rate from that, you can monitor for your patient for arrhythmias, um, maybe monitor after you've given medication. On the other hand, the 12 lead is more diagnostic in nature where we can see ischemia, we can see damage that's occurred to the heart, or damage that's occurred to the heart prior to this um, incident. It's a much bigger picture much bigger picture. It's like buying a car. You see the front end of the car in a picture and it's nice and shiny and bright and everything looks good, but meanwhile when you go see it and you've already paid your down payment, next thing you know, oh it's all smashed in. So it's no good because you don't see that on a 2 lead. You only see that on a 12 lead. So just looking at some of the components of ECG, kind of real quick and dirty, when you're looking left to right Okay, um, that's a measurement in time, and you can either go with milliseconds or in seconds. Uh, they kind of equate each other, and anything above or below the isoelectric line or the baseline, that's amplitude and direction of electrical flow. Okay, so now looking at these uh, boxes and looking at different intervals and widths of things on the monitor and on the ECG and what's showing is normal or abnormal, um, the little boxes, the little, the little tiny square boxes, okay, um, one square box wide is um, like 40 milliseconds, okay, um, or 0 .40 seconds. 0 .04 seconds. 
Yeah, point zero four seconds. Um, so when we're looking at um, the PR interval, um, the PR interval should be between 120 milliseconds to 200 milliseconds, and they shouldn't be any wider than 200 milliseconds. Or it should be between three small boxes and five small yeah, right, boxes. Right. Um, when we look at the QRS, we're not too concerned about how narrow it is. Uh, we look at make sure it's upright. It is narrow, but it should not exceed 120 milliseconds in width. And we don't want it wider than three small boxes. Right. And then when we look at the T wave, uh, the T wave should not be any higher than uh, five millimeters above the isoelectric line. Five small boxes. Now, when we look at the ST segment, okay, and this is where the whole measuring thing is taking place for our uh, STEMIs or MIs, myocardial infarctions, or acute MI, um, remember that uh, based on elevation above or below the isoelectric line, specifically above for infarct, it should not be more than uh, one millimeter above the isoelectric line. And so this is the reading from where your QRS comes back up to the baseline at the end, to the beginning of the T wave. And, or you could look at it in terms it should not be higher than one small box, or two according to your STEMI protocol. Yeah, and anything in the chest leads would be, uh, in the chest leads it's two millimeters above the isoelectric line, so your V leads, your precordial leads, and then the limb, the limb leads uh, should represent uh, one millimeter above the isoelectric line, just for confirmation purposes. So like two, three, AV, or two, three, and yeah. one. So we're all familiar with the step-by-step -step process, um, however, we will review it just briefly. So the first thing when we have a printout of a lead to ECG strip, for example, determine the heart rate and its regularity. Um, determine what your PR interval is. And so again, we discussed that should be between three and five small boxes. Yeah, or 120 to 200 milliseconds wide. <laughs> Yep. Um, then look at your QRS complex and determine basically just its width. We want to know if it's narrow or skinny. So narrow would be less than three small boxes and wide would be greater than three small boxes. Or 120 milliseconds. And what if it's three boxes? It's 120 milliseconds. Right, it has to be greater, um, less than three small boxes. Yep. Uh, the ratio of our P wave to our QRS, basically look at your P waves and how many QRS are there. So if we had a P wave and then a QRS following, that would be a one to one ratio. If we had two P waves and one QRS, it would be a two to one ratio. Um, and then attempt to interpret your overall ECG strip. And um, do that by including the heart rate. And we're gonna go over some guidelines in the next few slides of uh, commonalities between ECGs. So off the top of our head, we're gonna just talk about some commonalities between um, particular ECG rhythm. So the sinus rhythms, they generally have a P wave, well they must have a P wave yep. in front of them to be considered sinus rhythms, generally between 60 and 100 um, with um, a narrow QRS and an appropriate looking T wave. Could have an ST elevation or depression, it's still a sinus rhythm if it has a, if it has a P wave. Junctional rhythms can present three different ways, um, either with absolutely no P wave, meaning the rhythm is initiating at the AV junction, uh, the P wave could be retrograde, meaning it comes after um, the QRS complex, or if present prior to the QRS complex, it may appear um, inverted or upside down because the rhythm is actually being initiated at the AV junction and then being transmitted back upwards, so it will appear um, inverted. Yeah, it's inverted. The tachycardias, uh, generally when we hear that, we're thinking of uh, VTAC. Um, so the tachycardias basically just mean a heart rate that is greater than 100. Um, and the one that we're most concerned with most times uh, is the VTAC at greater than 120 or, or higher. Yep. Um, and then we get into the AV blocks where a portion of the AV um, node is, is not functioning appropriately. So for whatever reason, maybe the um, electrical impulses slowed at the AV junction or maybe blocked completely, intermittently or permanently, and we'll discuss that. Yeah, and with the AV, the blocks, uh, it's generally, it goes down lower and lower and lower along the electrical pathway, and that's where you get like your first degree, type one, type two, and then your third.
So commonalities between um, other rhythms, VTAC, VFib, fine VFib, and asystole, these are your cardiac arrest rhythms. Um, ventricular tachycardia in the cardiac arrest patient will present as wide and fast, um, greater than 120. VFib will present as fibrillatory, uh, tracing no organized rhythm. It will also be uh, fast as read on your monitor. Fine VFib is a variation of that, uh, where it will just appear as more of a flat line, and as it flattens, it will become into a systole. Um, something we didn't mention was where um, SVT and PSVT fit in. So they would fit in with the tachycardias um, and reentry mechanisms. So let's do some practice. Just take a look at the strips as we proceed through uh, the remainder of the webinar and we're just going to talk about um, what we're seeing on there. So the first thing, the rhythm uh, appears regular. Um, if you multiply, that's a six second strip, so if you multiplied by 10, the heart rate would be approximately 40. Yeah. yeah, and uh, with looking at that rhythm, um, there's a P wave before every QRS, there's a QRS after every P. QRS complexes are upright, they're narrow, and if you map them out, they seem to be regular. The PR interval is less than uh, 200 milliseconds, okay, or five little squares. Um, so everything looks good, and so when you determine the rate, as Christine said, uh, six second strip, you can multiply by 10. Um, if you want to use the scaling method where you count down the 300, 150, 175, 60, 50, 43, 37, 33, and see where your next R wave maps out, that's fine as well. Most people look at the monitor and check the pulse okay. to see if it's consistent, if the electrical equals mechanical output. Mm -hmm. So for this, uh, sinus bradycardia. So right away when we look at this strip, uh, we notice this appears really slow. Definitely the heart rate's about 30 if we were to multiply the QRS complexes by 10. Um, the, Q the QRS complexes look somewhat bizarre. Um, they're wide, they're greater than three small boxes. And if you look at the P waves, they seem to be all over the place. They seem to be almost marching right through the QRS complexes. And when this occurs, um, we call it an AV mismatch, so an atrial ventricular mismatch. In this case, this is a third degree AV block at a rate of 30. So we look at this rhythm here, um, we're looking at it and there is a P wave before every QRS. There is a QRS after every P. The QRS complexes are upright, they're narrow, they're regular, the PR interval is less than 200 milliseconds or five little squares. Um, the T wave has a good shape to it and the T waves are all present here. Um, this, because of the P wave being present, the discernible P wave, um, as well as uh, T wave being there and very rapid rate, uh, this would be considered uh, sinus tachycardia. Uh, when you look at the rate, um, it is about, it is actually about 150 beats a minute. Um, uh, generally, SVTs are SVTs are 150 meters a minute and greater, but you would not be able to see the P wave at all. It's buried in the preceding T wave. Now, with respect to that, sinus tack is between 100 and 140 beats per minute, generally speaking. And it's important to note in this example as well, this is when you would see a short PR interval. Yeah. So there's only certain circumstances or rhythms where the PR interval is going to be shortened or less than three small boxes. One is sinus tachycardia and the other is a junctional rhythm and we'll look at that later as well. So looking at this rhythm um, compared to the last rhythm, you can't see a discernible P wave. Um, this is extremely fast. I believe the heart rate's approximately 180. So um, is it all that significant to be able to recognize that this is an SVT? Not necessarily. Take a look at your patient and see if they're hemodynamically stable. Um, potential for hypotension in this patient is um, significant. And at the end of the day, the rate is too fast to sustain um, their blood pressure, then, then that's what's important to recognize here. However, for the purposes of this webinar, um, just take a look at, at how an ST, SVT presents. So looking at this, these two rhythms here, um, wide, they're fast, um, they're regular uh, in nature, um, this, this is VTAC. 
So just different presentations. Uh, they can look a little bit different, but the key point with VTAC, it's wide, it's fast, and it's regular. Patients with a pulse, um, they need to be cardioverted. I need to get to an emergency department. Okay, uh, if patient is VSA, um, and you're doing manual rhythm interpretation, absolutely charge up and shock this patient. And the, if the patient does have a pulse, or the potential for hemodynamic um, instability is there, so make sure you're monitoring your blood pressure, have an IV in place if you're certified. Um, if they are hypotensive, blood pressure less than 90, then you'll bolus them according to your um, directive. So looking at these last four rhythms, uh, the top one on your screen, um, asystole, um, this should show a heart rate of zero, cardiac standstill, the heart, there is no electrical activity, nothing is going on in the heart. Uh, the second strip down, uh, we look at that, it'd be like a fine V-fib, so absolutely, um, that should be shockable, whether you're in semi-automatic mode or manual mode, if, you are, um, if you're certified in manual defibrillation, then absolutely charge up and shock that. The third strip down, this would be uh, a coarse V-fib or a moderate V-fib, um, and absolutely, the shockable rhythm, your machine, if you're in semi-automatic mode, should be able to shock that. If you're doing manual interpretation, charge up and shock. And the very last one, the one in green, uh, it's a kind of a funny looking VTAC. Uh, you could argue that it's, that it's torsades, um, you could go back and forth on that, but it, it does look uh, like it does look like a VTAC, and absolutely, this would be shockable. Yeah, and so anything wide and fast, shock, if they're pulseless. So we do need to discuss the right ventricular infarct, um, because it's something that keeps coming up again and again. In your directives, it says that nitroglycerin is contraindicated in the setting of a right ventricular infarct. Um, however, um, in our region, we are not performing right-sided um, right ECG interpretation. So, um, in essence, uh, the contraindication is not applicable to us. As long as the vitals fall within the normal parameters, um, we've said this at the last few research, continue to treat your patient. Generally, people who have a right ventricular infarct uh, will start about 70% of the time will result bradycardic and hypotensive right out of the gate. Right, they'll present you to you like that. So, so they're um, contraindicated for nitro anyway. Correct. And so if you have a heart rate of 103, then that's with, or I'm sorry, a blood pressure of 103 systolic, that fits your parameters for nitroglycerin use as long as there's no other contraindication, so you are to administer it. So this is the conclusion of the uh, ECG pre-course webinar. Uh, if you have any questions about this uh, or any of your other medical directors, uh, feel free to contact any one of us, uh, regional paramedic educators, uh, at the email um, listed below.